I made a dining table with a crazy angled base and some hidden storage to keep my kids' homework supplies out of the way. This is by far my most complicated build I have done to date. From the angled bridle joints, to the sliding dovetails, to the splines, a lot of things that I've never done before, but just figured it out as I went along. So keep on watching if you're interested in seeing me figure it all out. But before we get started, huge thank you to this week's sponsor, Woodcraft, whose tools helped me along the way. All right, let's jump into it. I'm gonna start with the base here. So I'm using eight quarter ash that I'm going to mill up into some square stock and I cut it to rough length at the miter saw and I don't have a jointer, so I used my tapering jig just set up straight so that I could make one smooth edge that I could reference against the fence of my table saw to mill up the rest into some square stock. I designed the base on SketchUp so that I could print out a template to use as a reference for how long to cut each piece. And then I proceeded to cut them on my miter sled with a 30 degree angle cut on the ends. To join all of these angles for the base, I decided to go with a bridle joint because it is one of the strongest joints out there and it is very easy to make. I actually made an entire separate video on how to make these angled bridle joints. So I'll put the link somewhere so that you guys can check that out if you'd like. Basically, I used a tenoning jig to hog out the center for the mortise and then I used that as a reference for the tenon and then I used the tenoning jig again to create the definition of the tenon. Then I used the miter sled again set to a 30 degree angle to finish off the rest of the joint. In my angled bridle joint video, I said that I was going to come up with a solution to help clamp these pieces at the correct angle. But honestly, my kids were home from break and the best solution that I could come up with was to just um, hold them together using brute force at the correct angle and then clamping them down. It worked. Moving on to the bottom of the base, all these pieces are going to meet at a 30 degree angle to each other. So that means that I had to mark two 60 degree angles creating a point at their ends. I set my miter gauge to 60 degrees and to make sure that I cut these perfectly, I actually cut a little bit shy from those lines that I made so that I could sneak up on the cut. You could see here there's still not a point at the end, so I just kept slowly taking very, very thin passes until I got a perfect point. Now that I had dialed in the first one, I had set the stop block to the correct distance so that it would create a point on all the pieces every time. This was really satisfying to put together. But I can't just glue those pieces together like that because it's all end grain touching each other and it would not be a strong joint. So I decided to join them all together using a spline connecting all the pieces. So I used the tenoning jig to make one cut and then I used a half inch piece of plywood that I'm going to use as the spline as a reference to make the second cut. Then I could just hog out the middle of all of the pieces to create the space for the spline. I cut the half inch piece of plywood so that it would fit in between the two boards that were facing each other. And then I marked out the center of that board to create a hexagon. I cut off the corners with my fence set to 30 degrees, both reaching to that corner that I had made. And then I measured the sides uh, that I just cut out there and made a mark for the third edge, lined up that line on the kerf on my sled made the next cut for the hexagon and then repeated the same process of marking off how long the sides are to make the final cut for the hexagon spline. Now before gluing this up, I actually tested out a number of ways to clamp this up. And this way seemed to be the best and most efficient. So I used my work table that I know is truly flat and I glued the spline into place and onto the pieces and then made sure that each angle was 30 degrees to each other and then clamped it down to my workbench. I also made sure to clean up any of the glue squeeze out because it would be hard to clean up later. Once the bottom of the base dried, I was able to then connect on those middle sections that I had glued up earlier. So I just put them into place. Also, again, making sure that they were set at the correct angle before clamping them down. And then I also made sure after clamping them down that they were at the correct angle like 40 times. And while that dried, I got to working on the storage box. It's going to be a plywood box that's going to be the shape of a hexagon. So I cut one end at 30 degrees and then set up a stop block for my cut and then made the cut 
and then I could flip my board around against the stop lock and continue making the rest of the cuts. The bottom of the box is going to be a quarter inch piece of plywood that's going to be housed in a groove that runs around the inside of the box. So I traced the inside of the box to make a hexagon and then marked out about 3 8 inch out to make a larger hexagon so that way it will sit into the groove in the box and then I cut it out at the bandsaw. In order to make that groove that the bottom will fit in, I just ran the pieces on the table saw using my kerf maker to get the perfect thickness for the groove. The box is going to be attached to the rest of the base using a sliding dovetail. So I made this quick little jig to be able to make the slots of the sliding dovetail safely at the router table. I took one pass with a straight bit and then I swapped it out for a dovetail bit and then I finished off the cut. This is going to be a stopped sliding dovetail. So I made sure to stop moving the jig when the front of the plywood hit the outfeed fence. Now it's finally time to glue up the box. So I put glue in all the grooves and in all the sides and then I used a band clamp to make sure that it was tightly clamped together. Now I didn't trust the strength of those joints there so I decided to reinforce them with some splines. So I figured that I can use my adjustable tenoning jig that I had made in a previous video as a spline jig. It seemed to hold the piece pretty well so I decided to give it a go. After setting it in position, I just passed the jig along the fence and it seemed to do a pretty good job. So I continued to make the rest of the cuts on the top of the box and then I made all the rest of the cuts on the bottom of the box. To make the splines, I used my thin ripping jig set to the distance that was the same thickness as the blade and the pieces fit perfectly into the slots. I then cut those strips into triangles at the bandsaw and then did a really sloppy, messy job gluing them in. Once dry, I can cut away at the excess with a handsaw and then it was time to figure out how long to cut those top pieces that were going to connect the box to the rest of the base. So I lined it up so that they were all centered so that I could mark out how long to cut those pieces. And then I measured how deep that groove was that I made for the sliding dovetail and then added that thickness to that line that I just made and then I could cut it to the perfect length before making the mating dovetail piece that's going to go into the slot. This took a lot of shallow passes to get it to the perfect fit. So I just kept taking small passes on either side with the dovetail bit until finally I got the perfect fitting sliding dovetail. But the only problem is that because it's a stopped cut, it was round. So I had to compensate for that by making the end of the dovetail part round as well. So I used my chisel and then I refined it with a rasp a little bit more. And now it's a perfect fit, so I can glue all these pieces into place. So I'm actually going to be covering up that plywood with some edge banding. So I left a little bit of an excess on top and then used my thin ripping jig to cut a piece to that thickness. And then I ripped them to the thickness of the plywood. And then in order for them to sit on top of the plywood fl flush, flushly, flush, I um, cut away um, at that excess that was sticking up with some hand saws and then refined it just a little bit more with a chisel. Then I took those strips that I had cut earlier and I cut 30 degree angles on all of their ends and then glued them into place and used some tape as a clamp to hold them down while the glue set up. Now this was probably one of the most satisfying parts of this build to see that top compartment piece just click right into place into the rest of the base. All of my measuring and math actually worked out and I could not have been happier. And then of course once the glue dried I had to make sure that the base would hold up. Now that I realized that the concept for the base was going to work I decided to move on to the top. It's made out of five quarter ash that I rough cut on the miter saw. The table is going to be 54 inches, so I made this trammel of sorts with two holes that were 27 inches apart. This way I could mark out the circle, and that way I can mark out where I'm going to put biscuits. That way I will not cut into any biscuits when I cut out the circle. I used my router table to make the slots for the biscuits because 
I don't have a biscuit joiner. And the reason why I use the biscuits is just for alignment in all these boards. Since they're so long, I wanna keep them as straight and level as possible. They do not add any added strength. Because this table is so large, I figured that it would be easier to glue it up into sections first instead of gluing all the panels at once. So I had three sections that I glued up separately, and then after that dried, I was able to then attach all of those three sections, and it made it way easier. So it was right about at this point that I realized how difficult this was going to be for me to manage. I wasn't sure how I was going to move this thing around, but in the end, I made it all work. Uh, you'll see me struggle a little bit, but I made it work. To cut the top into a circle, I attached a circle cutting jig onto my router. This was just made out of some scrap um, piece of MDF that I had lying around, and I measured 27 inches from the edge of the bit, and then I drilled a pilot hole that I'm going to put a nail into. I then put a pilot hole into the center of my tabletop, and then I banged a skinny little nail into place. And then I just began the process of routing out the circle. So I was not able to plunge all the way through with the bit that I was using, so I ended up having to cut out the rest with a jigsaw. So at first I tried to do it like this through the top of the cut that I made, but I saw that it was tearing out and I just didn't want to have to deal with that mess. So I flipped it over and then I cut out the rest from the underside. And I had already drawn out that circle, so I was able to follow the lines pretty easily. And I also just kept periodically checking underneath the table to make sure that I was staying on the right path and that I was not cutting into the tabletop at all. The jigsaw leaves a really rough cut, but it's not a big deal because there's a perfect circle to reference with a flush cut trim bit in my trim router. In retrospect, it would have been better to make my circle cutting jig out of half inch material instead of three quarter inch so that I could fully plunge and avoid all of these extra steps. Despite using the biscuits, there were still some boards that were a bit uneven, so I just used my hand plane to flush them up as best as I possibly could, and then began the arduous sanding process. I sanded for what felt like weeks, and every time that I had to flip this tabletop to do something to either side, I felt like I was getting the best workout of my life, and I seriously think that flipping tabletops should be a competitive sport. The storage compartment is going to need a lid. So I put the base upside down on the tabletop and then I measured all around making sure that it was even and in the correct location. Then I traced out the outside of the hexagon box and then I removed the base and then marked about 3 8 inch in from those lines that I made and then connected those lines to make a smaller hexagon inside that larger hexagon. This is going to create a sort of lip for the lid to rest on when it's in place. So this was probably one of the most nerve wracking things I've done in my woodworking career. I plunged into my tabletop with a mini circular saw against a fence to create the lines for the hexagon. I originally wanted to use um, a router jig, but I didn't have any bits that were thin enough and I didn't want the gap to be so thick. So after plunging away and cutting out on the first side of the hexagon, I then flipped the table over so that I could enlarge in the cut on the other side, which will help me cut it away easier with a handsaw afterwards. So I actually made one tiny little mistake and I overshot one of them, but we'll fix that in a bit. So to cut out the rest of the hexagon, I used a handsaw to meet into those corners and then the hexagon lid was free. Back to that mistake, I cut a thin strip at the table saw and then rounded over one of the edges to match the curve of the blade that I was using. And then I just glued that into place. While the glue dried, I sanded the lid at my bench top sander and then I was able to cut away at that patch using my hand saws and no one will ever know that it was there except for you guys. <laughs> Moving on, I added a heavy chamfer on the underside of the tabletop just to lighten the look a little bit and I filled any little holes like from the circle jig or voids with some black CA glue. And now the lid needs some way to lift it up. So I used a large Forstner bit to drill out a little recess 
and then a smaller Forstner bit to drill a through hole. That way when you put your finger through the through hole, it's comfortable and it has a recess for your finger to fit in. And then I had to bring everything inside for finishing. So I decided to stain this all black to match the decor in my kitchen. I know a lot of people are going to be a little upset about this, but it just goes better in my house. And I, I do love the look of the ash, but I think that this looks great in my kitchen. After letting the intense black stain dry, I finished it up with some Rubio Monocoat Oil. So it's a three to one mixture with three parts oil and one part hardener. And then you just have to spread it all around and then buff it in with a buffing pad. So my shoulders were already killing me from flipping these tabletops. So I decided to make my life just a little bit easier and put a buffing pad on my sander and that worked out really amazingly. And I almost forgot to attach the tabletop fasteners. So I'm using these figure eight fasteners. I totally should have done this before staining because everything got all dusty again. But basically you just drill away with the Forstner bit and then pre-drill into the center of that and then lock down the figure eight fasteners with screws. And then after you bring on the tabletop, you just drill from the underside. The hard part is putting on the tabletop. <laughs> I'm probably gonna get a few comments here about not wearing the proper equipment on my feet. And yes, I know I totally didn't realize I should have known better. Once the top was in place, I could then pre-drill from underneath the tabletop into the fasteners and then just lock it all down with screws and it's done. All right, so here it is in its final space in my kitchen. I'm able to sit six chairs comfortably around it and I'm just so thrilled with how this turned out. I went into this really not knowing how to do a lot of things or not knowing how I was going to do a lot of the things and just figured it out as I went along and I could not be happier with the results. So some really positive things about the table, the way that the angles are for the base, it really leaves it open for your legs and for your knees. My six foot four husband was able to sit comfortably without his feet bumping into any part of the base. So I think that that's super awesome and it looks cool too. Um, I just love that my kids' homework supplies are going to be out of the way. They used to sit on top of a table on a bucket and it drove me nuts. So now everything is going to be hidden and I am a little concerned that they are going to be coloring on the table. I'm just gonna have to maybe deal with it or get some brown paper to put over the table every time they are here. But whatever, this is where they do their homework. I, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. So if you wanna build something like this and you don't have a need for homework supplies or coloring supplies, you can make it um, a storage for placemats or silverware or anything like that. It's just a cool idea to have storage. Uh, somebody on Instagram had a question and said, don't you think crumbs are going to fall into the holes? And I'm not really too concerned about that. I mean, if we are eating, ugh, maybe I'll take a placemat or something and just cover up the center and that way it will prevent anything from falling in. But I'm really not too concerned about it. Um, if the crumbs do fall in, it would fall into the cracks, like lift up the lid and just vacuum it up. I really don't think that that is a big issue. But what I do think is a little bit of an issue is the, the lid, it's a little bit heavy. I'm able to comfortably lift it up, but I think my kids are gonna like bang it and smash it everywhere. So what I think that I might do is I might route out um, like a deep pocket to make like this top part thinner and that way it won't be so big and bulky and so heavy for the kids. So that's just one little change that I would make. Um, and other than that, I don't think I would do anything else. Oh, maybe I would add some C-channel underneath to keep it from bowing. I'm not sure if it's going to bow or not because it's not like so supported like at, at the ends here. Um, this whole table was just an experiment. So I guess we could just keep experimenting with that. And if I find that the table is bowing, I can add C-channel at another date or just in my future projects, I will just add it. So thank you guys again so much for watching and thank you to Woodcraft for sponsoring this video. Could not have done it without them. I will see you on the next project.